Hello everyone. My name is Dina Ata. I'm working as a petroleum engineer at Khalda Petroleum Company. I'm your, I'm your moderator today. Um, I want to welcome all of you today and I want to welcome Yusuf uh, today, our uh, session presenter. Uh, let me introduce him to you. Engineer Yusuf El Waziri uh, is a drilling and completion field engineer for Technip FMC in West Texas. He uh, worked as a, as a frack engineer in, in Permian Basin. Uh, he graduated from Texas Tech with the PSCC and, the M and the MSCC degrees in petroleum engineering. His research is focused on hydraulic fracturing and defect analysis. Uh, I hope you enjoy our session today. Uh, so, uh, Yusuf, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Engineer Dina. Thank you very much, Dr. Garhi, uh, for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my second session with you uh, on this internship program. I uh, hope you guys are uh, learning a lot and, and taking advantage of this uh, opportunity presented to you. So uh, last time we talked about uh, frac equipment and operations. Uh, we just wanted to give you some more insight this time and uh, try to have you visit the field by uh, taking pictures and getting videos and, and try to make you guys feel that you are in the field and seeing the equipment yourselves and not just having some slides and presentations in front of you. So <clears throat> we'll follow the same procedure or outline that we had last time. Introduction about fracking. Uh, we'll see what a frack location looks like, what the frack equipment is, the wellhead, wireline, and we'll finish with questions. So last time we talked about uh, fracturing and we said, what is fracturing? Uh, just, I'm just gonna remind you guys. Uh, so we said it's a well simulation technique that is usually used in low permeability formation, but it can also be used in high permeability formation where we inject at a high rate and a high pressure uh, mixture, which is called the frac fluid, which is mainly water, chemicals, and sand. And uh, the purpose is to create conductivity to the formation. Uh, and there was some confusion last time and some questions, follow-up questions after the presentation. She said, what is the difference between permeability and conductivity? Isn't it the same? Uh, since I mentioned last time that fracking does not increase permeability, but it increases conductivity. So we said that permeability is basically a property of the rock, property of the formation, whereas conductivity is just the permeability times the width. So whenever we do fracking, we mainly play with the width, increasing the conductivity, which is what we care about. So whenever we open up a fracture with water, sand goes inside, fracture closes again, and then the grains of sand is what keeps the fracture open, creating width and conductivity. So this is what a frac location looks like. That's what we uh, showed to you guys last time. Again, we said that locations might be looking different depending on where you are and depending on what equipment you have on location, depending on, on, on where you are in the world. But this is a typical, just typical frac location where you have in the back the fluid storage for the water since the water is the most important component in the fracturing fluid, we have the propane storage in the back, which is the sand. The chemicals, all these three come together in the blender. This is just a reminder. Everything gets mixed in the blender and then gets supplied to the pumps. The pumps, based on the horsepower, pressurize the fluid and pump it through the manifold into the wellhead. Uh, also a question that I noticed um, people asked, whenever we do zipper fracking and there's several wellheads, having several wellheads next to each other means that you have two different wells, lateral wells next to each other. They can be going parallel, they can be going in different location, they can be having different depth, different direction. Uh, but yeah, they're next to each other. Uh, for uh, for fracking purposes and for for, for, for making it easier. Uh, doc, they, we, we, we saw a couple of presentations where they talk about zipper fracking, where basically we'd be going to this well, frack it, and then while the wire line is on the other well, and then vice versa. So now I'm gonna 
show you what a typical FEC location looks like. I'm gonna to try to be as slow as I can in the video and maybe repeat it. So this is whenever you walk in into a FEC location. We're just gonna be going around, okay? So first thing here, this is the wireline truck where the wire engineer, wireline engineer sits. He's the one who controls the plug and perf operation that we talked about last time, where we have a plug that is set and then shots fired to be able to frack after that. So that's the wireline truck. This is the engineer's truck. But whenever I say wireline truck, the engineer sits inside where he, he monitors the, the pressure and the rate and the depth of the guns. Here you can see all these are, are basically the shots. So, so the shots are made next to each other and they create the wireline string. But these are the shots. So you have a, a, a bag like here, uh, storage for the, the shots that have not been fired. And then next to it, the shots, the shots that have been fired because they have to be counted. You cannot just, this is explosives. And since explosive is something dangerous, it has to be accounted for. So if you go to location with 100, you have to come back with 100. These are the wellheads. As you can see, this is wireline. Here, this is the wireline lubricator. The red, the red stuff here are the accumulators that we talked about, the ones that have the handle that we use to open and close the valves. We'll, we'll see that in further, but I'm just giving you an, an overview. This is the data van that we talked about last time where all the computers are, the pump operator is, the company man sits, the supervisor sits, the frack engineer sits, everything is in this trailer where everyone sits and controls everything outside and monitor everything that is outside. So here's the data van. There we go, this is the data van. This is the crane that lifts wireline and allows it to move. This is the grease trailer that we use to pump grease into the valves to make sure that they can open and close freely. Here's another view. These are some storage tanks. So in that case, these storage tanks are for uh, pump down, which is what we use to push the, the, the guns for wireline, but an example of, of storage tanks or fluid storage. These are sand boxes. So we talked last time about how we can have different scenarios for storing sand. It can be the silo, which is the big vertical building. It can be sand kings, which is like this huge truck. And these are sand boxes where every box has around 50,000 pounds of sand. And you just get the box, use the sand in it. And then whenever the sand is, the box is empty, put it back on a, tray, on a, on a truck and the truck takes it to get filled with sand and then it comes back. So here we have some boxes on location, just as backup so we can use. Here you go, see some, a lot of them since we use approximately 300,000 pounds of sand. First stage, oh, let's back up a little bit. Here you can see this is a forklift. So it has some kind of like, like it says a fork that it goes under the box to lift it up and move it around. So this is how you move around uh, uh, the sand boxes. And this area is called the dance floor. Why is it called the dance floor? Because this forklift can go here, pick up a box and then come set it here to be used. And then whenever it's empty, pick it up, take it to the side here, where it's gonna, where it's gonna get loaded on this truck. So. Let's see, see this blue thing, this blue thing, this is actually a truck, see? 
here you can see this is a truck and this truck basically comes with a box that is full of sand drops off this box full of sand and then the forklift puts an empty box again on this truck this truck leaves with the empty box go get a tree filled at a facility and then come back so this is how sand is brought to location and we we talked about it last time in the silos so you have a sand truck that comes empties the sand inside of the silo and then whenever the truck is empty leaves and gets filled with sand and come back so it's all the same concept. So again, we're just going around location. This is where the chemicals are. Here, you can see the ISOs. And behind these ISOs is going to be the blender. But we cannot see it from this video, but we'll see it in, in other videos. So here is the crane for wireline. So as you can see, we're we're making the turn around location, just showing you guys how everything looks like. And that's here's some more uh, storage for water, so fluid storage. And this is the blender here. Inside. And someone asked last time about the environmental uh, problems uh, with fracking. So here, as you can see here, this is a frack location in Pennsylvania uh, where they're more strict. So as you can see on the floor, there's some black containment so that if anything falls, it does not touch the ground. This containment is gonna go and get thrown away at the end of the job. So let's start with the iron. Now, someone was confused last time about the iron uh, that we talked about and we said what iron is. Iron is basically small pieces of pipe that we use at a high pressure to be able to connect all our equipment together and have the fluid flow or the liquid, the fracturing fluid flow all the way from the blender to all the way to the well and inside of the well. So here we can see this is our iron, right? Coming from a pump, going all the way to the line. And here we can see the iron going to the wellhead. Now I'm playing this video. This is a frack location before any equipment comes to location, before the frack pumps come to location and before the blender comes to location. Just all we can see, the first thing that comes on location is the wellhead. So the wellhead is the first thing, it's, it's rigged up. You have the lower master, upper master, the wing valves and the crown valve, right? If you look here, you see that we have iron. What do we have? We have small pieces of pipes, right? That they come on pallets stacked on top of each other, right? And then we'll use these pipes to make these lines. So they have a wing and they get connected, just like you can say Lego. You, 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 you play with them, you put them together to create your lines, as you can see here, lines. And then if we need to change direction, just like here, we use something called a swivel or a chicksen uh, to change direction. So here you can see all the iron comes separate and then we rig it up. Again, like we said last time, rig up, what does rig up mean? It means to, uh, to put it together. And this is, the wellhead so we can connect the iron from the pump side uh, from here the wing side to pump down and the other side will be for flow back here's the swivels that we talked about that we can use to change direction here is we talked last time about the ground the ground valve or the wheel valve and the check valve. Let's see first the ground, the, the wheel valve. See, this is the wheel that we use to close. So see this yellow line? Yellow line means that the valve is open because fluid can flow. Whenever you turn this wheel, this yellow line is gonna shift and it's gonna be perpendicular to this line. 
showing that the valve is closed means that the fluid is going to try to come, but then it's going to be blocked. So that's the wheel valve. Now the check valve, the one after it, this is the check valve. We talked about the check valve last time. We said that the check valve is used to protect the equipment and it allows fluid to flow only in one direction. So if you look here, there's going to be an arrow. You see the arrow on the check valve? I'll point at it now. Here you go. The arrow shows that this check valve allows fluid to flow only in this direction, from here to here. And I, I took a picture of the inside of the check valve to see how it allows fluid to flow only in one direction. So basically from here to here, you see this flapper and whenever it's down right now, right? Whenever water or fluid comes with this direction, the, it's gonna push the flapper up, allowing the fluid to flow. If there's nothing, it's gonna go down. Now, what if we have fluid coming in this direction, trying to go up? What's well, gonna be pushing the flapper, the flapper is not gonna move. So it's gonna block anything to come to the other side. Hoses now. Talked about the hoses last time. We said that they're usually for lower pressures, um, 150 for suction, 400 for discharge and how there's acid hoses and, uh, and such. So this is our blender. See, these are the hoses from the discharge side of the blender and they're going into the manifold. And now on the suction side of the blender, these are the water tanks. And from the water tanks, we have the hoses going into the suction side of the blender. So, the suction side of the blender is connected to the water tanks. This is where it sucks water and then it gets mixed into the tub and then gets discharged on this side. It gets discharged from the blender. So the discharge side goes to the manifold where it's gonna go to the pumps basically. So now that we talked about the iron and uh, the hoses, we can start talking about the fluid storage. I, I pretty much, I think we saw what fluid storage is. These are these containers. We show them where uh, they get provided with water and then the water is provided to the blender uh, for the fluid mixture. And these are also some more uh, fluid storage in that case they were used for pump down. Chemicals. Now the chemicals, we said that might be different ways of storing chemicals. So if you remember, we said there's a C10. The C10 is the truck that where we have chemicals on it and we use pumps, different kinds of pumps. And that was a question on the last quiz. The What pumps can we use? So we have different types of pumps and the pumps pump chemicals through these lines and it's gonna go straight to the tub of the blender. And here's also the totes. So we said the totes which contain approximately 300 or 330 gallons of, of chemical, right? And they're, they're also connected to a pump and goes to the blender. Another type of chemical that we, don't, we didn't talk about last time, and I'm, I wanna mention now, is diesel. So as you can see, this is a diesel container on location, and it has line going through it. Basically, how do all the equipments work? Mostly, all the frag pumps, and I said mostly, work with diesel. So you need di diesel to, to make the pumps work. There's some newer or different equipment or electric feet, fleets that work with electricity, but most of, the, most of the equipment work with diesel. So we have here how we're gonna, we have a diesel tank uh, located on location and it's elevated for safety uh, reasons. And then through the lines, diesel goes to every single pump to supply diesel to the pumps. Uh, these are the totes, right, that we talked about. And I'll, I'll show you how. So, you notice that the video is loud. Uh, that's actually uh, not even as loud as it, it is because the pumps are not working here. I'm inside of the red zone I cannot be inside of the red zone whenever they're pumping, 
By red zone is basically any area where there's pressure. For safety reasons, you cannot be in an area where you have pressure around you. So whenever even the pumps are running, it's even more loud. But try to use the try to focus here. You can see here these are the totes, and you have lines coming out from the totes. Right? And these lines go inside of the blender. You see this line and this line? These are all hoses, chemical hoses that go inside of the tub of the blender. Let's not forget about the isolation, the isos, I mean. The isos are the bigger tanks that can hold up to 5,000 gallons of chemical, and they're usually used for the chemicals that we use the most, which is uh, FR, but it can be used for any other chemical. So here are the, the isos. If you, uh, if you have a chemical that you use often, like FR friction reducer, you cannot keep getting totes of 330 gallons because you might be using around 100 or 200 gallons for one stage. So it's not going to be very smart to get a lot of totes and keep moving them and refilling them. So in the case of, of some chemicals, we get these big isos. Now let's go to the propane storage. So this is the silo. We talked about the silo last time where we have so the silo and it has a conveyor belt. So you open up the gate of the silo, takes to the conveyor belt, conveyor belt drops the sand into the hopper of the blender and the augers take your sand into the tub. Again, here, this is the silo, conveyor belt, just like at the supermarket, drops it in the hopper and here you go. The other type is the sandboxes that I introduced to you guys this time. Uh, here you go, you see these are the sandboxes and you see the truck here, this big truck. It brings the sandbox, drops it off and picks up one that is empty. There you go. And this is on another location. Again, you see the sandboxes. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you guys here how it works. So the sandbox, it comes and it dropped on, again, this kind of conveyor belt. You see the, you see this is, is where the sand falls in and then there's a conveyor belt in the bottom. So we put the box on this conveyor belt and this is all the conveyor belt, goes all the way, get dropped into the hopper of the blender. And this is your blender. And then the augers of the blender are going to lift it up and put it in the tub, and that's the tub. Again, let's play this video again. Let's start it. So these are the sandboxes. A forklift is going to come and drop off the sandboxes next to each other on this conveyor belt. Open up the gate. Conveyor belt is going to slide it, lift it up, and then drop it inside of the hopper. And then the hopper is going to lift it through the augers into the tub, and then it's going to get mixed with the water and other chemicals. So now let's talk about the blender. So we said the blender is where we get the water, the chemicals, and the sand all in one tub mixed together. So now I'm on the suction side. We have the storage, uh, the water storage. Okay, it says the recording has stopped, but I believe you guys can hear me. So Dina or Dr. Ahmed, if there's any problems, please let me know. So now the pumps. Um, let's talk about the pumps. So we, we said that what's important for the fracturing fluid is to be pressurized to uh, reach a specific rate and a specific uh, pressure, right? So we use pumps for that. So here we're seeing the pumps. And here I'm showing you a different 
kind of pump that's connected to the missile. We're gonna go on the pump. And we're gonna look at the pump itself. So we have a fluid end and a power end. This is the fluid end on this side. And this is the power end. So the power end, as we said, the power end is the one that has the gears, all the different gears. And this is basically more mechanical work. This is what generates power. And the fluid end is what has seats and valves is what pressurizes the fluid. And in the middle, what we see here, here are the plungers. Whenever it works, the plungers, it's a positive displacement pump, right? So you have the, the pistons going in and out, pressurizing the fluid. Here, this is again the manifold, right? And this is the a hose, which means that it's low pressure because we said low pressure Hose, high pressure is iron. So we have a hose. It's gonna go to the suction side, your suction side of the blender, right? And then the discharge side of the blender after it gets pressured, it's gonna be through the iron, which goes to the iron side. And from the iron, all the way to the wellhead. Again, we'll restart the video. The bottom side is the low pressure. It's gonna go through a hose. So fracturing fluid is gonna go through a hose, through and from the hose, it's gonna go here to the suction side. So low pressure, it's gonna go inside, get pressurized inside of the fluid end. And then whenever it's pressurized, it's gonna come out from this iron side. Now, since it's high pressure, it cannot go into the iron, into a hose anymore. It has to be through iron, right? So it's gonna come out, go through the iron, all the way to the manifold here, the top of the manifold, again, it's iron, and it's gonna go straight to the wellhead. Let's start this video, sorry about the noise. Try to reduce it a little bit. Okay. So, I'm showing you again, fluid end, power end, and then the mechanical component, this is the Shaft. You have the radiator, you have all the mechanical equipment. This is the tank and this is the diesel. I was telling you guys that it has to be supplied diesel. So this is a hose for the diesel. This is the tank. Radiator. And then all of this is on a pump. It's on a, sorry, a truck that we'll see right now. Why is it on a truck? It's because frac locations last a couple of weeks. So you can see here, it's a truck. Why is it a truck? Because frac jobs are for two weeks, three weeks, a month maximum, and then they have to move to another location. So how do we move all these equipment? We move all these equipment with trucks. That's why the trucks are, uh, uh, and that's why the equipment are on trucks. Uh, at the end of the job, we're gonna disconnect the, the, the iron and the hoses that are in the back, right? That are inside here. And then the truck can drive off and go to the next location. Okay, now let's talk about the data van. We said that the data van is where we control everything. I'm gonna try to show you, I showed you guys this picture last time. This is an example of a data van. Okay, this is the seat of the supervisor. He's having the screens in front of him. You can also see this is the, the frack engineer sits next to him. Behind him is the company man. So that's the company man that sits behind the supervisor and behind the engineer to oversee their work. Now, again, this is another video. This is the screen that controls the silos where the sand is. So you click here, you open silo number one or number two or number three. Uh, 
Okay, here's another screen where you can see it says discharge pressure. See, we're at 80.9 barrels per minute. Uh, suction at 80, the sand, how many pounds of sand. So all of these are, are parameters that in are in front of the supervisor and he controls everything. Usually in the Middle East, this is the, the engineer's job. Uh, but in other locations, it's a supervisor's job. We can also see the density. The target density is 0.5 pound per, per gallon. We're at 0.556. You see auger one, auger two, auger three, auger four. The auger is the screw on the blender that lifts the sand from the hopper to the tub. So here we're seeing auger number one, zero RPM. So it's not working. Auger number three, zero RPM. It's not working. Auger number two is at 59 RPM. So here we're seeing that auger number two is the only one that's working. And then on the other screen here, you have, it looks complicated. It looks like it's a lot of numbers, but it's really not when you look at it. So you have pressure. Number one, you have two transducers that treat pressure. One of them is saying 5809, one of them is 5821, so they're close. And this is the pressure on every well. This is the total amount of, of sand that has been pumped. We can see 86, almost 87,000 pounds of sand here. FR, we're at 0 0.02. Uh, so it's just the different parameters. Everything is in front of him. Uh, we see the, the Basically, everything is in front of him. If, if something doesn't look right, then he needs to make a call and, and fix it. Discharge with 100 PSI. Just all the numbers are in front of him. And again, all these numbers are also in front of the FRAC engineer, and the FRAC engineer also has access to a, to a FRAC software like FRAC Pro, or depends, there's different softwares where he, he records all this data and then provide it to the customer. Uh, now let's talk about the wellheads. So, and we'll we'll finish with flowback and wireline. So again, we said that the wellhead is the first thing that comes to location. So I'm showing you this guy, you guys, this video again, where uh, the first thing that comes on location is what the wellheads. Again, there's some iron uh, that needs to be connected. This is your lower master, this is your upper master, and you have your wing valves, one side for pump down and one side for flow back, and on the top, the crown valve. I'm gonna show you guys here how it's rigged up because wellhead can, can go up to 10 or 15,000 PSI, it's very important. So their connections are flanged. What does flanged means? It means that uh, unlike iron, it's, it's, it's more complicated where you need to get it torqued so it, that's why it needs to be done at the beginning of the of the job and it's heavy equipment so we use the crane to uh to rig it up so so this is a piece of iron as you can see it's heavy so they're using the crane to lift it up push it and then they'll torque it with a torque wrench so look it up here then this is the zipper manifold that we talked about the zipper manifold is what allows the fluid to go on one well or the other. So these, this would go to this well. This would go to this last well. And again, this is this is still not ready. It's getting rigged up on location. So I wanted to show you guys how it comes to location and then the, the end product. And this is a top view. This is the crown valve, these are the wing valves. And you'll see now that, see now between the zipper and the, there's black iron that was not in this video, right? In this video, we just showed, see the zipper and the wellhead and there was nothing in the middle. So now that we, we hooked up the iron between the zipper that goes to the wellhead.
So what's the point again of the zipper? Is to allow fluid to flow in the desired wellhead. So we can see here one leg, a second leg, a third, a fourth. So if we want fluid to go to this well, we would close all the other valves, open these two valves, and then flow from the pumps. It's gonna flow here through this side and go to this wellhead. Obviously the, the connection in the middle is missing, but it's still getting rigged up. Now if you want fluid to flow on this well, so we'd close the two valves here, the two valves here, the valves at the back and open these two, and that's how fluid is gonna to go to this well. And that's how we do zipper factory. Try to take a close up of, of the isolate of these valves. So here you go. You see, if you want fluid to flow to this well, you open up these two valves, these two valves, and fluid's gonna to go to this well. And, and, and that's it. It's just like electricity. Whenever you have electricity in parallel and you have like parallel um, uh, electricity and, and you want this side to uh, this light bulb to open but not the others you open switch right that's how it is in in parallel same thing here now a very good question someone asked last time how do you control or how do you open and close the valves of the wellhead from far away is it manual or hydraulic we said that some of them are manual and they have a wheel that we turn and some of them are, these are the hydraulic ones. So the hydraulic ones can be operated by an accumulator. See, for example, it says upper master. So it's controlled the upper master. It's closed and open. Move the hand to open, pushes hydraulic fluid, opens it. And it's set to a thousand PSI, but that's not important. But yeah, you can see all right inside wing, left inside wing. Every valve is, is labeled and it has hoses of hydraulic fluid that go to it. I'm going to show you now the back of the accumulator. You see all these uh, hoses? These are the hoses that have hydraulic fluid. So whenever, whenever, for example, we open the valve for right inside wing, open, and this one is right inside wing, you can have hydraulic fluid going to this one at 1,000 PSI pushing it and allowing it to open. So these are the hoses. The hoses here go nice and neatly all the way to the wellhead. Here. All these are hydraulic hoses. This is what allows you to control every valve from outside. Now let's go to flow control, which is flow back. Now what happens if we want to flow the well and get clean out the well or get the sand out of the well or whatever, or the plug. Um, so this is the flow back wing. It's connected to the flow back iron and the flow back iron is going to go straight either to the pit. The pit is man-made, right? Or we have some flow back uh, tanks too, depends on, on the location. So here is the iron coming from the flow back wing going all here oh yeah here is the flow back system you can see this is a choke this is how you control your flow let's say you're getting 100 barrels a minute or whatever and you want to decrease the flow going to the pit you turn the, the this choke and basically it's a needle that if it goes in basically it closes the flow all the way and if it goes out all the way it allows the flow all the way so that's how you control your flow with a series of valves here, the choke. Goes straight to the pit. And here's the pit. It's man-made, basically they got some uh, sand and made some kind of a big bathtub. Uh, man-made and have everything uh, go there obviously that's not where the oil that's produced goes but that's if they need flow back during fracking they have and they want to the well they want to get everything that's inside of the well out that's what they do perfect now let's go to wireline and we'll finish up with wireline 
So just a reminder, we said that in wireline, we do plug and perf operations. So where we set a plug and then shot perfs and then come outside, get another plug and other shots, set a plug, get the perfs and so on. So here you can see, this is the wireline string. It's already ready. On the bottom, we're gonna see the plug. Here, this is the plug. And these are the shots. Through the crane, it's gonna get lifted up into the wireline lubricator. There you go. It's going up into the wireline lubricator right now. This is your plug. And then whenever it goes inside of the lubricator, the crane operator moves the wireline lubricator to put it on the desired well. So here you go, you see the crane operator, just a regular crane, and he's moving the pull string, and then he's gonna set it on the desired well. So he's approaching, looks like he's gonna try to set it on the swipe well. So he's gonna try to set it on the right well. Here it's going inside. Now he's hooked up to the swipe well. Now, how to make sure that, because uh, again, it's gonna be at a high pressure, how, how to make sure that it's locked and it's not gonna, no fluid's gonna come out. So it needs to get, to get locked. Again, this is, so this is a Technip FMC equipment, it's called SPC. There's other equipment that basically do, do the same thing, but different concept, or actually it's same concept, but different way of operating it, like rig lock or others or real power, but that's the whole point of, of, uh, of uh, having wireline isolated. So here it's connected. And you see how I'm gonna replay this video? I'm gonna zoom in and you'll see that there's a ring that's gonna slide down. Whenever this ring slide down, it means that it's locked and you can now pressure test and, and you're not gonna have any leaks. So here you go, I'm gonna zoom in. And here's the, see the, the ring going down? It means that it's locked. After it gets locked, the crane is gonna try to pull to make sure that it's locked in place and it's not gonna come out. And then they're gonna conduct the pressure test. And then whenever the frax, the wireline stage is done, the gun comes back and they lower the gun down. So you can see they're lowering down the gun from the wireline indicator. The shots are already shot. And if we look here, we're not gonna see a plug anymore. The plug is down hole. There's no more plug. And the shots, the company man comes and looks at the shots and make sure that the shots are gone. See, there's no more plug. The plug is not there anymore. And then next to it are the guns that are ready. So these guns, so this gun has a plug and it has the shots. So they're just gonna connect to this string and go ahead and get ready. To That's all I have for you guys. Uh, I hope I answered the questions that you were wondering. And if not, then I'll be more than happy to answer your questions now. Uh, um, thank you so much, Yusuf, for this uh, session. Really, it was very informative. And I have some questions from the audience to you. Sure. Um, the first one, uh, which is you know, repeated from a lot of audience, what is the difference between the manifold and the missile? Okay, good question. So the missile, let's, I'm gonna go back. So the manifold is here. The manifold is here, it's in the middle of the pumps and it's where all the fracturing fluid comes from the pumps connected to one manifold, right? So the manifold is mainly for the pumps or the manifold is also called a missile. So 
I'm sorry about the confusion. So this is called a missile or a manifold. It has both, both names. The other manifold I was talking about was the zipper manifold. The zipper manifold is going to be located by the wellheads, and it's only there whenever we're fracking different wells at the same time. So let's say we have only one wellhead. You will have your manifold here or your zip or, or your missile, sorry, and it's going to be connected straight to the wellhead. But in the case of having multiple wells next to each other, you're not only going to have a missile, so you're going to have a missile here in the back, but it's not shown in this picture. You're also going to have a zipper manifold. A zipper manifold, it's a manifold also, but for zipper factoring. What is zipper factoring is whenever you're trying to frack several wells at the same time. So what if I want to factory this blue well, right? I'm going to close the missiles for the on the other legs and allow fluid to flow through the these blue valves all the way to the blue uh, wellhead. But yeah, that's a good question. Sorry about the confusion. Uh, we'll, we'll stick with missile is for the pumps. Zipper manifold is for zipper fracking. Okay, the second question, uh, how much sand is injected to keep the frack open and what the factors affect is this amount? So a good question also, and uh, that's, that's usually the job of the operator company. It depends on the formation. It depends on what conductivity they wanna achieve. It depends on the, the permeability of the formation. So they do the design they also, it depends on the fracture length that they want to achieve. Do they want to get a very long fracture or a, or, a, or a shorter fracture? It depends on the rate that they're pumping at, that they're pumping at 80, uh, 80 barrels a minute or 100 barrels a minute. So these are all factors affecting how much sand is going to go in place. But what happens is that uh, the engineer is going to come up with whatever design they want to pump and then give this design to the service company. And, uh, and usually it's the same amount of sand on every stage. Okay, thank you, Yusuf. The, the next, next one. Um, what, is, what are the safety precautions during the frack operation? Good question. The, the, the most important one is whenever fracking is, is going on. So we'll go on this slide. So whenever we're pumping, whenever we're fracking, the first safety rule is to not to be inside of this area at all. So inside of the red zone. So before we start fracking, they have to say on the radio that they're gonna start fracking, they're gonna start pressure testing, and everyone has to be outside as any human trace has to be outside by the data van here behind these trucks. No one can be inside of the iron. Uh, and most importantly, not step over any iron because you have to always assume that this iron is pressurized. This iron, iron has pressure on it. What if something happened and it breaks at 10,000 PSI hitting you is going to kill you. So, so that's, the, that's the most important uh, rule. The second most important rule is communication. Make sure that you're always in communication with all the other parties around you because you have fracking company, you have chemical company, you have water transfer company, you have wireline company. So the second most important rule is, is communication. Make sure that you're in communication with, with all the other parties. Okay, thank you. The next one, uh, what happened to the fluid after complete, completing of uh, the job? It just waste or reused? So whenever you pump, it doesn't come back, right? It comes back during flow back. So during flowback operations, you'll see whenever we, we saw here that whenever we flow back, we have, we're going to have a lot of fluid coming back. And, and most of this fluid is water. And, uh, and uh, a lot of this fluid is used again for fracking operation. So whenever you, you're, you're fracking, you can be using fresh water, but you can also be used produced water. So this is going to be produced water. It has to be treated somehow. You have to use some chemicals. They, Operators actually hire companies to treat produced waters, and the produced water can be used again uh, in, in fracking operations. Okay. Uh, the next uh, one. Um, is, uh, is there be any situation when propent get lost in the formation? Does it happen in real? 
So obviously there's no way to know where the where the where the propent exactly goes, right? But that's the point of doing wireline plug and perf is that whenever you're, you're, you're perforating one specific area, you're only allowing this fluid or this propent and this fracturing fluid to go in this specific area, right? If you have not fluid going anywhere else, it means you have a problem in your casing. You have a, lease in your, a leak in your casing and you'll definitely see that real quickly uh, because there's transducer on the casing and whenever you read the pressure on the casing, if, you, if you're seeing any leaks or any pressure on the casing, it means that you have a problem on the casing and that that's a cementing problem most probably or your casing broke and you need another casing. But but yeah, that's that's the whole point of, of plug and perf is that you're only allowing the sand to go in this specific interval. Okay. And uh, the next one in frac location, um, if there is any color coding and what each color means. Perfect, that's, uh, so color coding is just for, to make it easier. Uh, uh, it's not always uh, used, but I'll show here a picture. So, for example, here we used colors for the wells, blue well, red well, white well, this is orange, this is just a yellow valve. But yeah, we're coding just to make sure that, because if, if a well has a number, you can get confused. People in the field can get confused. So it's just easier to you to say, hey, a blue well, let's frag the blue well. Let's close all the valves and just open the blue wells. And based on that, also you'll notice that the accumulators have colors. Here it's purple. So purple means for the purple well. So that's the only use of colors is just to make it, to make it uh, easier and to avoid any uh, mistakes. For example, closing a wrong valve which is a huge problem because if you close a wrong valve, you might cut wire line. And if you cut wire line, you're gonna lose the guns down hole, which is very expensive to achieve. So it's for safety and to make it easy. Okay, uh, the next one, uh, is the well head used in the flag jobs different than uh, the one used in the normal production? Is the what, sorry? Uh, the, the well head used in the flag job. Yeah. It, it, it is different from the, the one used in the normal operation or in a normal production operation. No, it's not actually. So uh, it's just, it's not the, it is exactly the same ones, but for example, for frac operations, let me get a picture where we can see. Yeah. So for example, in frac jobs, we need a lot of, of valves, but for example, for whenever we're after drilling, we only use the lower master valve. So the lower master valve is there during drilling and, and stays there after that. The other ones are rental valves. They're the same, but again, what's the point of paying for them whenever frac operation is done? So as soon as frac operation is done, we, we nipple them down or rig them down, take them back to the yard and leave only the valves that are needed. Since again, we always need a double barrier only. So we just leave two valves for double barrier and take everything back to the shop. But yeah, it is the exact same valve. Yusuf, I, I think uh, they mean the frac head. They are talking about the frac head. So, um, um, they're talking about maybe, the, fra maybe the frac head. Maybe he mean the frac head. head. Maybe. The frac head. The frac valves, yes. No, no, I the mean frac the frac head, head all, all the head together. Oh, yeah. So, it would be different, yeah. Uh, different in the pressure rating, I think, or, or something it, else. Well, I mean, usually for drilling, you don't need 15K, for example, but for frac, you need up to 15K. So again, that's why it's all rental equipment. So if you need a, a 15K valve, you would rent a 15K valve just for the two weeks of, of fracking. And then that's it. Okay. Um, we have a lot of, quest of questions, but uh, we don't have a time. Yani. So thank you so much, Yusuf, for this presentation. I hope you all audience enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I'm personally enjoyed it so much, Yanni. Thank Thanks you. so much, Yusuf, and all of our audience. Thank, thank you. you so very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Gahi, and thank you for all the participants, and I wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.